brothers and sisters to today's edition of our ongoing study in course 101 understanding elohim the godhead and today we're in lesson 14 and today i tell you listen whenever we get to this subject matter in 31 years of teaching the world this is one that approach with a lot of fear and trembling so to say reverential fear and trembling at Elohim because what the Holy Scripture says of these things are so mind-boggling about Elohim that you ask yourself why then do does the average Christian not know these truths did the Lord made a mistake in allowing those things to be written not in one place not to two not three not four not five not ten not fifteen not twenty when you put them together so much references that's why today cause 101 understanding Elohim lesson 14 we're going to talk about some strange truths about the personhood of Elohim covered by the veil of religion father in heaven Thank you for what you're doing in this place. Lord, we ask you to continue to peel off the veil of religion through the world. Let the sword of spirit continue to take effect and teach your people, empower your people, deliver your people from all things that are traditions of men so that we can walk in kingdom truth and be empowered thereby. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. So lesson 14. Strange truths about the personhood of Elohim covered by the veil of religion. Throughout the Old Testament, Elohim was wrapped up in a mystery. He was to the average Hebrew a God that was afar off. We've told you before, the day the law was given, the Torah, the people couldn't approach the mountain. Nobody could approach the mountain. And the pain of death so he had always been a God afar off. Even Moses, for the glory of Elohim upon him, his face shone. He had to put a veil. So Moses became a step down transformer. And from that day on, most times, Israel could only approach him through the mediatory role of priests, you know, ordained for such purposes. And then even as we so in an earlier part of this lesson, in that dispensation, when it was afar off, it was only a couple, a handful of people. Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, Zerubbabel, and a few other prophets who literally had him speak or encountered him or had some closer intimacy with him. So in the course of downloading course 128, understanding the human nature, Elohim lifted one of the veils of religion to share some truths which kind of shook this vessel initially. And I tell you, every time I have to teach these things, I don't go about it with, you know, I have to be in prayer. I have to literally seek the Lord's you know, grace and enablement to be able to share because there are such deep truths that you don't want to approach it with levity lest you be, you know, get into profanity. But the thing is that it is there. The things the Lord took away when we're looking at the human nature. And today, I want to say that we're going to look at some of them because with repeated inspiration from Holy Spirit, the inescapable conclusion is that the veil of religion causes evil spirit-filled believers to walk in less than full understanding of the personhood of Elohim. And that is why even those who are born against spirit-filled will miss the timing of the return of the Lord. And not only that, a good number of spirit-filled ministers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are going to literally make the way for the manifestation of the man of sin. You know why? Because even though spirit filled, remember the gifts and callings of Elohim are without repentance because they do not understand the deeper realms of truth. You find that people get into so many things. And that's why the average Christian is not able to achieve victory over sin, victory over the world. This is why the average Christian is despairing because there are certain things Elohim wants us to know about himself, which when we know them by the Spirit and when we 
open our hearts and embrace them in our heart and it transforms our hearts and renews our mind, is going to enable us to walk in greater confidence and to begin to know that we are not happenstances, that he created us for purpose. And if he has brought himself down to the level where he wants to have relationship with us, we will not, out of a false humility, say, no, no, I can't go, I don't want to come near, let me stay afar. No, he wants to draw near us, and he calls us to draw near with a true heart so that we can receive the fullness of him. Brothers and sisters, let's now go to one of the things that, you know, is a little bit on improperly or insufficiently discussed. It is about the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, underline our image, after our likeness, underline it, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Elohim then made man in his own image and likeness. Brothers and sisters, it's so important that we have to decode the two terms in his image and likeness so that we can really open ourselves to come into the level of intimate relationship he wants us to so that we know that the Elohim we serve, who is our Father, is not like the gods of this world that have eyes they cannot see. They are molded and they are, they, they are chiseled, they are out of timber or out of clay. Our Elohim made us. We are the sheep of his pasture. Now let's try to get some of the things he said about we were created in his image and his likeness. In his image. His image speaks of his holy nature. We know that. Many t people know that he was holy Elohim, he wanted us to reflect him. Now, it's also important for us to know that that intimacy of being created in his image is to enable us to be able to worship him the way he is. And, you know, the law of relationship is that like begets like and like walks with like. For instance, First Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Take note of that. Be holy. Why would he demand anything of us except that he has given us the capacity to be it? He says he created us in his image. And this image is holy. And that's what redemption did. When Yeshua took our place at the cross, he paid the price for sin to take away the capacity of Satan and sin and the world to dominate us and use our vessels to do whatever he likes so that we can come to the place where we can be like him, we can have interaction with him because of that holy nature of his which he is putting in us. Now let's look at the mystery of his likeness. Now let's go on to where it will be more profound. Like image and likeness. Brothers and sisters, likeness refers to his triune personhood. The triune personhood of Elohim. And what is that personhood? We well, say in our own image, after our likeness, the personhood of Elohim shows us Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one in nature, one in essence. Humankind was created also as a triune being with spirit, soul, and body all functioning together to reflect him. And the Lord wants us to know that we need to embrace the reality that the likeness of Elohim re relate, refers to the reality that human beings, the human being Elohim created on creation money was to reflect how he himself is made up of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yet one. And so, what do we know about Elohim? We are told in John 4, 24, Elohim is spirit. And they that worship him or worship him in spirit and in truth. We all know this from scripture. And the spirit of Elohim, Elohim is spirit. The supreme ruler of the universe is a spirit being, primarily. Okay, 
Most times we know that from catechism, from lessons with time we're children, we know that Elohim is spirit. There's some of things that we are not fully in, you know, imparted into right from an early age is some of the things we want to talk today. So one of his likeness, therefore, since scripture is best understood by comparing scripture with scripture, we got to just go on to say how was Elohim, how was Adam created by Elohim? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground. We mentioned it in one of the lessons. He formed man. He scooped down. He stooped down to the earth, scooped the raw earth, began to mold a, a figure, an object. He looked at it, okay, fine. He did some adjustment there, 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 there. It looked fine. And that's what Genesis 2 7 says. And breathed into him the breath of life, a measure of his own spirit. And the Bible says, man became a living soul. So a lifeless physical body, a spirit, a measure of the spirit of Elohim, infused into it, activated the third rim called the soul. So you have the spirit from heaven, the earth, the, 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 earth, the earth from the ground, which became the body, and then the soul became a in a function of the quickening of the body by the spirit. In other words, it became the property through which man was to know his environment, man was to be able to make some decisions, spirit, soul, and body made up man. So, what is the soul? Let's look at the soul. The soul is a realm of man where you have the mind, and up there, the imagination through which you, you can see pictures and, 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 and things, you know, things, graphic images, things you see. You can see things. Then the memory where you retain certain things that have happened before. So the imagination into the future, the memory, the past, then the mind where these things are processed, your past experiences, your current challenges, all these things are part of the mind, part of the soul. The mind is one of the rim of the soul. All I've described is a mind which is a part of the soul. Then the soul also has the emotion where you have feelings, where you can love, you can hate, you can, you know, be vexed, so in your spirit, man, you can respond to things. The soul speaks of that rim of self-expression where the, you can be touched in the emotions of the soul and it's so important to understand and the will where you make decisions those things are the soul so brothers and sisters the hard truth that it was a, a little bit of too high for me to grasp was that Elohim who is a spirit being also manifests properties of what we call soul theology from the perspective of Christian religion does not explicitly teach things that apart from being a spirit, Elohim manifests the qualities that collectively reveal what is ascribed to the soul, and that is hidden in plain sight in all scriptures, are revelations of Elohim that is not like Elohim's other, I mean, like not like any other God. Other gods don't manifest that property. Other gods are lifeless, or they are things that are conjured up, they do not have their ability to imagine, to ability to remember, the ability to, you know, uh, love and feel things. But let's look at what scripture says. Unlike the soul of humans that was conceived in sin, the soul of Elohim is absolutely holy, pure, and incorruptible. There's no corruption of evil that is in it and can never be. James 1.30 says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of Elohim, for Elohim cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. So there's nothing corrupt in Elohim to respond to evil. Habakkuk 1.13, 
that of a purer eyes and to behold evil and cast not look on iniquity. You know, so Elohim, his eyes are too pure. He cannot gaze on, he cannot see, you know, in the sense of people seeing and imagining. No. Then his soul, it is in his soul. Now take note of the things where you know the soul at work. It is in his soul that Elohim displays all the emotions that are recorded in the Bible. In the Bible, you see in Genesis chapter 6, 5 and 6, he grieved his heart, and his heart was full of pain. When he remembered the old world, before he destroyed it, he was grieved that he created man. He was pained that the wickedness, the evil he saw. Then we also told in Numbers 11, 1, his anger was aroused regarding what was happening to the Israelites. He, he see also in the Bible, he was well pleased, he was concerned, he was vexed in his saw displeasure as in Psalm 2. He was vexed in saw displeasure. He you know, there was righteous indignation for the sinfulness of human beings he created and the people of the world who are resisting his rulership. In Genesis 8.21, Elohim smelled the aroma of Noah's sacrifice. He smelled it. It's there in black and white. Noah offered the sacrifice after he came out of the flood, he came out of the ark, and Elohim in heaven smelled the aroma of the sacrifice. And that's where he now pronounced the doctrine of seed time and harvest time. Then let's look at number 2.3, when James 4 says that the spirit of Elohim in us is jealous over us and does not want us to love carnal things and things of the world, we're simply reminded that he operates with that dimension of what you call soul, that ability to feel, that ability to, 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 to imagine, that ability to creatively design the environment of the world, he manifests that. So he doesn't want to see the spirit of the world in us, even covertly, not to talk about overtly. These days, not even covert again. People proudly display their worldliness their love of the world. People just advertise it on social media and various things. Then 2.4, it's in the mind of Elohim, his mind, that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 verse 8, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Yeshua saw. The Father saw. The Holy Spirit saw. What will happen to human beings that were being that will be created, and the provision was made even before the foundation of the world. Also, it was in the mind of Elohim, his soul, that he conceived the earth and then spoke it into being. He didn't just speak, let there be light, let there be this. He, he conceived it even today. That's what creative people do. The creative person see some things in the imagination you may be around them you may be spouse or children or parents that creative person is oblivious to anything around he just puts time maybe as an artist shows write down something say, wow look at the art where did it come from was it the finger no it was in the mind so Elohim saw this world and called it forth and it's still the principle of faith you see it if you can see it you can get it even though it's been corrupted by the name it and claim it people, but the truth is that if the Father plants in you a picture of something and you receive it from Him and accept it and it's for you, it's only a matter of time. You're going to see those things manifested. That is the truth. And that is how life is. Brothers and sisters, it was also in the mind of Elohim that, you know, he wanted to make man in his own image and likeness. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. So, it was all there inside his mind, inside his uh, imagination, inside his will that he will create man. He went about creating man. Then, men and brethren, in seven, in his soul, Elohim saw that all he created was good, I was very pleased with them. Genesis 1, 31. He looked around. All he created, wow, he was satisfied. Yes, I'm, you know, Elohim was satisfied with creation and was very, very pleased. And then creation ended. And when I began to explain in chapter 2 how the seven days, 
happened, the processes that it took place. Brothers and sisters, it is important to say that, you know, still on this subject, we need to be debunk the myth that in his incarnate state, Yeshua tolerated everything and everyone. No. His fair meekness was not weakness at all. While he had compassion on sinners, which is a function of his soul, compassion, empathy, a feeling for people, sinners who were going to be going to eternity, he also had compassion on the vulnerable, on people who were hungry. He would be preaching, and he looked at the people, they are fainting, they've been with him all day. He said, hey, bro, you know what? Look for food for them. He said, where can we find food? He said, what do you have? They bring their five loaves, two fishes, they bless them and give to them because of the empathy, the compassion he has because he manifests what we now call soul, those part of our being that connects with people's pain. Men and brethren, he was firm regarding sin. When he dealt with the religious leaders, he was very firm in rebuking them. But to sinners, what did he do? He would forgive them. He said, go and sin no more. In dealing with religious hypocrites, he was very strong on them. In Matthew chapter 23, 1 to 39, for instance, he pronounced woe on them repeatedly. And, in, you know, we also see that he was angry with those who made the house of worship a place of merchandise in John 2, 13 to 17, buying and selling, make money, profit, all that. It, it, it chased them out. And then so we see in the book of Mark 11, 15 to 17. Then number 11, in addition, he used various harsh words full of powerful emotion and imagery to describe the religious leaders, hypocrites, fools and blind, you know, and this was his soul in operation, they, they, their life, their hardness of heart touched him, inside of him. He, he was touched and he felt it, how these people could just be hard and blinded and they are marching to endless eternity and yet they do not know it and they are just there playing their religious game. Twelve, in the physical body and soul, Yeshua traveled and his soul was vexed sore at the prospect of Calvary cross until the father assured him it was necessary. In Matthew 26, 36 to 46 at the Garden of Gethsemane, we are told that he traveled. And one other account, I think it was in the book of Luke, talked about him, you know, being strengthened by angels because his tears were like blood, thick like blood, because in his soul he was vexed sore. He was vexed so what he was about to pass through. He didn't go through the cross like Elohim. He went through as man. Remember, he's son of Elohim, son of man. So he went to the cross as man. And the pain of what will happen, what the Roman soldiers would do to him, the crucifixion and all that, he was vexed so and asked the father, Father, will this pass away from me? And the father said, no. He said, well, if it is so, then what can I do? Nevertheless, Nevertheless, he said, let your will be done. It was all in the soul, traveling. Now let's take note of this. As a supreme spirit being, Elohim uses bodies for physical manifestation as he pleases him. That's another thing that blew my mind. Several years ago when the Lord first taught me, when he was giving us um, course 128, and I want to say this to you, is one of the courses we're going to teach this year, the Lord tarries. Because one, two, eight, when you understand the human nature, most of the things you go through, you'll be able to let go and not clutch at. When you see people act up and play their religious games around you, you can be able to see it because Elohim will give you the grace to see and know that people truly need help. So as a spirit, supreme spirit being, he uses bodies as it pleases him. Now let's look at under this 3.3. 3.1, in Genesis 3, 8 to 12, he came bodily to fellowship with Adam and Eve. When sin came in, they ran away from his presence. We are told that in the cool of the day, he normally comes to worship with them, fellowship with them. But this day that they sinned, they ran away. Sin will make anybody to run away from the presence. That's why some people go to church. They look for pillars to hide behind the pillar. They don't want to make eye contact with the preacher. Part of it is just sin. And people do different things. Then let's look at 3.2. In Genesis chapter 11, 
verse 1 to 9, he manifested physically to inspect what builders of the Tower of Babel were doing. In Genesis 13, 11, when the Tower was being built, he said, let's go down. He came down to see it. Then in number 3, in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, Elohim, you know, Yeshua himself appeared in the form of Melchizedek to Abraham. And if you want proof of that it was a, a Christophany or Yeshua in his pre-existent state coming into the earthly realm, you go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 19, that this Melchizedek was not an ordinary human being without father, without mother, without beginning or ending of days. He was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so that is a Christophany or Theophany, whichever way the theologians call it. So in number four, in Genesis 18, 1 to 33, was another Theophany where Elohim came bodily to Abraham to, for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was so terrible. This, uh, those two cities, their life was so terrible that Elohim had to come down from heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the encounter of Abraham with Elohim there, you see that when you go down, we say, Elohim say, will I hide anything from Abraham? I know him. He will tell his son, all his children, his household, all the things that I share with him, and he disclosed with Abraham when Abraham began to now intercede for him. Number five, let us remember that Isaiah saw the bodily manifestation of Elohim in Isaiah 6, 1 to 13. Isaiah saw the, the, on the year that King Hosea died, as he went to the temple, the covering cast was taken away. And because there was no more covering cast, he was able to see clearly, saw the glory of the high and lifted one, the glory reflected on him, and he saw the filthiness inside. He said, Woe is me, a man of unclean lips, I dwell among unclean people. Brothers and sisters, number six, 3.6 rather, the incarnation of Yeshua was the greatest theophany ever. Of all the bodily manifestations of Elohim in the, in the earthly realm to come and commune with people, it was in the incarnation. When, as Matthew 1, 18 to 25, and Luke 1, 26 to 35, you know, Holy Spirit planted Yeshua in the womb of Mary so that he can come forth as a human. Brothers and sisters, Elohim could have saved the world with the angels, if you wanted to, the day that Adam and Eve sinned, he could have saved the whole world. There would have been no need for redemption. But Elohim is an Elohim of order. He chose an unorthodox approach called the incarnation so that a being who could empathize with fallen humanity would be the legal instrument of redemption. And that's what you find in Psalm 115 verse 16. The heaven, even the heaven is the Lord's. The earth he has given to the sons of men. And so since that's the law, Elohim had established when it was time to redeem man, he didn't come like an angel swinging from heaven carrying a sword. He came in the form of a baby, the manger. He came in the form of a human being to fulfill that greatest act of theophany. Brothers and sisters, the more we learn this, if you have time, I want you to read Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We are told in verse 9, where we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of Elohim, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So when you read all of uh, Hebrews 2, 1 to 13, it's powerful and we need to understand. So lest we forget, Elohim used a body specifically prepared for that purpose to do the work of redemption in Yeshua. We're told in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 5, wherefore when he cometh into the wall, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body a body has thou prepared for me. A physical body. Yeshua had to use to operate in the earth ring. Spirit, soul, and body to operate in the earth ring. In that body, Elohim 
who had given to mankind the legal right over the earth rim, took flesh so that he could live as a man for 33 and a half years and pay the price of redemption. Brothers sisters, if we also look at number 3.7, during his incarnate state, Yeshua grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with the Father and humans. He didn't just drop from heaven, fully formed. He was born a baby in a manger. Then that baby began to grow. Luke 2.52, Yeshua increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with Elohim and with man. To function as a human being, really, so he can pay for all humans. 3.8, he was so, once so hungry that he cursed a fig tree which had no fruit for his creator. He was hungry at the time. And so he had to look for fruit. He didn't find Mark chapter 11, 12 to 14. On the morrow when they had come to Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree from afar off having leaves, he came. If happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to eat, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of leaves was not yet. And Yeshua answered and said unto him, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. The disciples had it. He cursed the fig tree because it cumbered the ground. The son of man, the owner of the whole universe, who created that tree, needed fruit from it. And the fruit could not come. That's why we've got to be careful. Don't be like a, an unproductive fig tree. Don't just live for yourself and just make your money and just accumulate your blessings and plan what to do with yourself. Don't be like that household that will say, I'm going to tear down my vine trees and my vines and my vats and go to build bigger barns and not know what tomorrow holds. Let's make hay while the sun shines. Let's invest in redeeming time to make sure that all that pertains to life and godliness is made manifest to us so that we can truly make hay. We need to be productive for the master. Let's also remember that at the cross, Yeshua was so drained of fluid that he was thirsty. He was drained of fluid. He was thirsty. He needed it. Just like you need water to quench your thirst. He was thirsty. And then let's also remember that in that physical body, Elohim demonstrated through the resurrection what death is. It is not the end of life but a transition to the hereafter. Death is not the end of life. It's a transition from one phase to the other. And so on this mind-boggling subject of how Elohim, whenever he chooses, he manifests the properties of his soul. Or whenever he chooses, he manifests you know, uh, the body, physical, uh, bodily manifestation and Yeshua's incarnation being the ultimate in in. Uh, 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 in that manifestation of the body, we also see something, brothers and sisters, that the gospels teach an Elohim who became like us, took flesh and blood in the greatest expression of love, so that we, he, he can condemn the power of sin over flesh and break the legal hold Satan had over humanity. You know, it's so important. You know, I mean, we often get finished two weeks ago. And the Lord had me just going back to dwell in how far, you know, it can quickly cover the whole of the New Testament and then go to the Old so that, you know, this refreshing will happen. And through the New Testament, today I'm in the book of John, okay, finish with Matthew, finish with Mark, finish with Luke, I'm in John, right at the middle. And one interesting thing about this is that you look at this, this you see Yeshua live the normal life. Live as a human. Live as a human. You know, he made flesh. And you discover that it was because the law could not make anyone perfect. Observance of external rituals cannot do it. Until today, many believers are external based. The Lord is interested in the inward part. He seeks for truth in the inward part. You know, men and brethren, why did Yeshua succeed in what he was called unto? The Bible tells us that since the blood of bulls and goats could not take away for sin, verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body that has prepared for thee. 
a body that has prepared me. A body was prepared for him. A burnt offering and sacrifice for sin that has no pleasure. Then he said, I know, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O Elohim. It's so interesting. The volume of the book, I want to ask you, have you ever asked the Lord to give you an idea of what is written about you in the volume of the book? I'm not talking about your ambitions, what you want to be, how much money you want to accumulate. I mean the very purpose for which he conceived you in his mind's eye. He brought you into this earth. Have you ever asked him and said, Lord, I don't want to come to you. I don't know when the end will come and I don't want to come empty-handed. I don't want to come, you know, just with any sense of thinking I've done something when I've done nothing. Lord, reveal to me what is written about me in the volume of the book. We're told about Yeshua. He knew what was written about him in the volume of the book, and that's why he did not allow anybody to take him off course. So let's look at some profound truths about Emmanuel. Brothers and sisters, it's comforting and gratifying to note these profound truths concerning Emmanuel the Elohim who was made flesh to dwell amongst us. Number one, when Yeshua and Mary, as Luke 1, 35 attest, he was designed to, uh, by the Father to be, according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, what was he designed to be? The express image of his person. The express image of his person. The brightness of his glory. That's what he was designed to do. Even in human form, it tells you something. That if you yield to the Lord and allow yourself to be totally consecrated to him, the Lord can manifest through your vessel what he plans for, what he wants to do. It's not about your ambition. It's not about what you want to achieve for him. It's about what he wants to use you to do, what he wants to accomplish through your vessel. So to surrender to that process is so important. So the body that was prepared for him was to enable him to manifest the express image of the person of Elohim in the air tree. Number two, Yeshua resurrected not as a mere spirit being like angels, but he resurrected in his glorified body. That same body prepared for him. That's what he glorified. He rose in, if you check Matthew 28, 1 to 28 and John 14, you know, it's the same principle and what he did in John 20. Number three, the reason Yeshua even conducted an intensive 40 days special school of ministry to prepare them for the outpouring of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Check Acts chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4. You discover that in that glory, Yeshua who rose from the dead, in that glorified body, he lived with them for 40 days. He conducted a school of ministry in those period of time, and he lived an ordinary life. They could see him. They could touch him. I'm coming to something important here. Now, for, for good effect, Yeshua, the reason Yeshua shared meals with his disciples, John 21, 1 to 14, he shared meals. He even told them, that this vine, he won't drink it until the Father's kingdom. Hey, that's something deep. He won't drink the vine again until the kingdom, the millennial reign. Why? In the millennial reign, you know, the vine will still be in all over, not just Israel. It will still be all over the world. It will still be able to give, you know, this beautiful uh, fruit of the vine. It's not alcoholic wine. So, number five, in John 20, 24 to 29, he asked the doubting Thomas to reach his hand and touch his side and feel the nail prints. It is important you get the whole Lord, the point the Lord is making that Yeshua, who was a Theophany of Elohim in the air train by the incarnation, did his assignment in the physical body and that body that was prepared for him. And when he finished that assignment at the cross, brought down three days, resurrected. He began to manifest certain things that give us cause to pause. To say something is here. And brothers and sisters, number six, it's important to establish a hidden truth concerning what happened on the resurrection morning. When he first rose from the dead, he did not allow the excited Mary or anyone else for that matter to touch him. 
John 20, 17. Many will say, Rabboni. He said, no, no, don't come near. I've not yet ascended to my father and to your father. Why? The mission he accomplished at the cross, he needed to go and show it in the court of heaven. Both with that body with which he resurrected and the blood that paid the price. The things in the heavenlies need to see that the mission that was sent in the atrium is fully accomplished. That's one of the high truths that we cannot fully comprehend. He needed to announce that he's done the assignment of the Father. Number seven, it was on this trip to the third heavens that Yeshua took captivity captive. As he rooted all the principalities, you know, that ruled in the first and second heavens, as he was ascending on high, he took them cap captive and took them out of the way. Ephesians 4, 8 to 10. That's why you have no business being fearful of powers of darkness or demons on all that. If you are Yeshua and if your life is laid on the cross for him, you have no business getting tired or troubled or fearful because he has taken away their powers. He's taken away their strength. He took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Have you known your gifts? Have you known the gifts with which you operate? Otherwise, you're going to be running around people. And there's all kinds of people who are offering themselves for people to run around. You know, see people, we see a lot of things. Out of where the Lord has planted us, we are busy building up people. Then some people come around us. They look for that brother. They look for that sister. They look for that young person. They look for that old person to grab them for their own uh, uh, objectives. And we, you know, the Lord shows us this. He say, you know, this is... That's how illegitimate authority comes. Somebody is being empowered by somebody the Lord has put to give the word of life, to bring to a place where the person achieves achieve breakthrough. You are looking how to capture that soul for yourself. And you are not taking the empowerment yourself. You want to capture somebody's soul and take them away from their destiny. Brothers and sisters, as we grow older in the Lord, you need to ask yourself, are you going to be one of those anybody can distract you from where the Lord is taking you, as the Lord is taking you, calling you, teaching you, deep, giving you deeper experiences and empowering you, then anybody can come and just grab you by the neck and pull you out of what the Lord wants to do? God forbid. That shouldn't be the case of anyone. You should come to a place where you are over and above to be captured. Your soul cannot be captured by any spirit of Nimrod, someone looking for your money or looking for anything from you, especially to divert you from the, the, the sustained operation of the spirit and the world that will lead you to get into your own orbit. Be careful. In this last day, there's so many hackers. If they're not just hacking Facebook, they are hacking destinies of people. And their desire is to see who they can grab. And they can tell you what God told them, but at the end of the day, it's the flesh talking. It's ambition talking. So brothers and sisters, Yeshua had to announce mission accomplished the court of heaven. Then on number seven, it was, uh, on uh, sorry, number eight, before then, let's also remember what Colossians tells us. In Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You have no business to fear principalities and powers. If your life is in Yeshua, is hidden with Elohim, is hidden with Yeshua in Elohim. If your life is there, you are safe, you are secure. Sealed by the blood, nothing can pluck you out of his hand. And that's why it's so important for us to know that one of the reasons why Yeshua paid the price in his own physical body, that physical body he carried, is this. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death where all their lifetime subject to bondage. You have no business being fearful of death. Death should not oppress you. The days the Lord has appointed you, nobody can determine it. Nobody can truncate it. Nobody can take it away by even one hour, one moment, or one day, not one person. The person has not been born and will never be born. Who can take away your life before the time? 
And the time the Lord has appointed you, if you are open to the Lord, all he wants to accomplish through your vessel will be accomplished before that time. And then let's also remember, number eight, therefore, that in that glorified body, Yeshua ascended on high publicly in Acts 1, 9 to 11. He was with them. Then he began to rise. And the people began to look. Then the angel said, you men of God, why are you looking? This same Yeshua, you see, ascending bodily, he will come in like manner. And you know what that means? It means number nine. Seated at the right hand of the Father, as part of the Godhead, is the ultimate mystery. Yeshua, carrying body, flesh, and body, the glorified one, the celestial one, quickened, the type we are going to have on the day of the rapture. And for those who are dead in Yeshua, the type they will have on the door of the first resurrection. Yeshua will, literally speaking, I mean, literally speaking, Yeshua is seated at the right hand of the Father. You have a, we have a near king's man at the throne of grace. When we are talking to our Father, we got to know that anything you are going through, challenges, all manner of things, people are playing around you, all that they are doing, he knows. And he says, don't look at people. Look unto me. Leave it with me. Men and brethren, one of the greatest things you can do in the, to deliver yourself, to be able to love people in spite of, despite all their schemes against you, plot against you, the greatest you can do is to learn how to hand over things to the Father. Whatever that will have worried you, he said in the book of First Peter, chapter 5, verse 10, casting all of your care, not some, all your care upon him, for he cared for you. So whatever anything wants to come, like a bother, worry, some you know, people talking or doing anything against you, just dump it to him. Not even, Lord, deal with this person. Lord, do no, don't do that. Dangerous prayers. People who are engaged in dangerous prayer, they will be surprised that many people who live on earth, they never committed immorality. They never stole. They never did evil. But what is before the Father is a long list of people they have killed with dangerous prayer. And they are glorying in it. You kill that your uncle. Kill that your friend. Kill that your neighbor. Uh, because of what? He did something you didn't like. And you felt so bad. And you began to pray. Lord, let them not see the light of the day. You went to the book of Psalms. Called conjured up something and pray that your ex is own. Listen, you are joking. Ex. Who told you about ex? That's the law of man. There is no ex in heaven. If you read Matthew 5, read Matthew 19, read First uh, Corinthians chapter 7, you know that these things are the traditions of men. So, give kill that ex. Let him see. He's not giving us money. Let him lose that ability to make money. They fire him from the job. You're happy. He begins to dream from there. He goes to prison from there. They kill him. The blood is on the hand of the one that prayed that series of dangerous prayers. If you knew the truth, you would not behave the way of religion. Brothers and sisters, let us know that at the right hand of majesty, he is our near king's man. Yeshua Hamashiach is a near king's man. He has borne his blood, flesh and blood, and he is seated in the glorified body he ascended on. This is too high. It's not something we can adequately talk about with lips because it's just too high. Let's stay where scripture say that he's a near king's man. But the question someone may ask, is there a difference between the body he bore or an our body? The answer is yes. Number one, the body Elohim uses is celestial. It's not of this earth. While the one will be on earth is earthly and earth bound. First Corinthians 5, 40, 45, 46. It's earthly and earth bound. It's clay. Our body has a span. On that day, it's gone. And just bury it. Give it seven weeks. You'll be shocked. It's gone. Only bones remaining. 20 weeks. It's gone. Only bones remaining. Nothing left. So the body of humans is earthly and earthbound. That 
that Yeshua used to walk on earth or the ones that Elohim comes, whether he came to see Abraham <coughs> or the or Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever things or Isaiah saw celestial. Two, the body will be a sin laden because of Abraham's, I mean Adam's original sin, which was passed on to all humanity. While the one Elohim uses for any operation in the earth room is pure and holy, the physical body of Yeshua and all the Theophanies manifestations of Elohim in the earth room. Number three, the body we bear is perishable, while that which Elohim uses when it pleases him is eternal and imperishable. And that is why the Father did not suffer the body of Yeshua to see corruption, to be decomposed. Why? Because it was created to be imperishable. Number four, the body Elohim uses is supernatural, capable of manifesting everywhere, every time, while the one we bear is natural, is static, is limited in time and place. For instance, the body Yeshua used to rise from the dead, that is body that was prepared for him, he was able to go past door and wall to where the disciples were and say, peace be unto you, and they were frightened. Appeared before them and yet spoke with them, and yet ate with them. The body that Elohim uses is supernatural. Number five, while on the earth, Yeshua chose as part of empty himself to stay in a place at a time until the resurrection. And so while he was on earth, he emptied himself of his glory. That's why after three and a half years, he gave up that life. He gave it up. Yes, we say that he was crucified by the Romans. The Jews betrayed him. They killed him. The truth is that he laid it down by himself. So in these last days, necessity is laid upon us to peel away all vestiges of religion and come to a place where we can understand that the love of Elohim for us is so awesome. We are the only beings in all creation, not just on earth. The galaxies, the, the entire system, the entire cosmos, it is only human beings are the beings whom he wants to relate with in this intimate way. So you cannot have intimate relationship with a stranger. That's why it's important to study the world. Study the world. Study the world. Get to know the world. Let the world transform us. When we know the truth that sets free, then we can press into the Zoe life. The life of Elohim can operate in man if we surrender our vessels for it to be, you know, taken out, burnt offering to the Lord, we lay it down, and we're dead to self. The Lord can indwell us. Our thoughts can be pure. Our imaginations pure. Our everything we do, our emotions pure. It doesn't matter what happens. Nothing on the outside can destabilize us because we come to the place and say, Oh, no man, nothing but love. Learn to love people, even your love people, even those who plot to, you know, do things, you know, just to come and do various kind of funny things around you. When you love them, you will cover the multitude of evil. And if the enemy wants to bring anxiety and worry, why this person is doing this way, cast it all upon the Lord. As for you, just go and love. Try this for size. You discover a whole new world. A world you never knew existed that your heart can truly be without aught. Can truly be without anything. And that's what another level of work of Holy Spirit called sanctification can do. And the trouble is that many people get sanctified historically. Seven years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago. The Lord doesn't want us to be historical about sanctification. Anytime you see yourself plotting what to do to take advantage of people. Anytime you see yourself scheming, you know, having some kind of Luciferian tendencies or serpentine spirit, and you're spirit-filled, you, you're born again, you're even a minister, you see those things. When you're sober, the Lord will show you, take it to the Lord and say, Lord, no, no, this is not you. This is not you. How can I take advantage of people who have trusted me? I'm doing all kinds of games. Lord, sanctify me. The Lord has a plan for you. He has what he wants to do through you. That's why we need to come to that place to press into relationship with him. If we know that our near kinsman, Yeshua, is at the throne of grace, the word impossible will disappear. What are we supposed to do with him? 
Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yeshua, the son of Elohim. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 7, 22-28 By so much was Yeshua made a surety of a better covenant. And they truly had many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Talking about the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. But this man, Yeshua, because he continued ever, has an unchanging, unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto the Father by him, seeing that he liveth ever to make intercession for them. Yeshua is making intercession for you at the throne of grace. Where he seated bodily. When you are accidenting of the Father, he has born flesh and blood. He can feel what you feel. Now we're turning verse 26. Excuse me. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needed not daily, as those high priests, to far offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have his family. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, make it the son who is consecrated forevermore. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, having a high priest over the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith with our wavering, for his faithful that promised. If you know that Elohim manifests the feelings, the properties of the soul, imagination, you can think, you can feel, you can pain him. You can, you can make him pain by your hardness of heart or things you ought to adjust in and you are clutch to them. If you know those things, you can fall on him, the rock, and ask him that, Lord, anything in me that is not making me to press into the fullness of you, Lord, I give it up. If you are still doing canal things, carrying your old canal mindset, and you want to make progress in the kingdom, you know, there are people who have already bought for themselves failure. Because every day they live, all years, they are planning and plotting, but what they are planning and plotting is with worldly mindset, worldly principles. And no matter what they try, what they do, do it doesn't amount to anything. And yet in the kingdom, the Lord has not called us to our ambition. He's called us to embrace his vision. And part of it has to do with understanding who he is. Let him that glory, glory in this that he know it and understandeth me, Elohim said. When you know that, honestly, you become a better vessel in his hand because you can surrender to Holy Spirit to search, to locate, and to give him right away to chalk off whatever that needs to be chalked off and to wholly and completely surrender yourself to the Lord. And you are not in this business of trying to create your own and make your own. And many things people are making on the last day, they put their... They are putrefying order in the, in the nostrils of Elohim because they are not being done on pure principles. They are being done on the same principles of the people of the world. And the Lord said, no, if you know that Elohim has made himself intimate with us by manifesting the properties of soul that Theophany is, with the ultimate Theophany being the manifestation of Elohim in Yeshua in the, in, in, at the fullness of time, you know that the Lord wants us to have such an intimate relationship, not religious relationship. And in that state, 
we are safe, we are secure. In that state, we can press into the fullness of the stature of Yeshua and we can become all the Lord wants us to be just by giving up, lifting him up, let him draw us to him. And let his word transform our hearts, renew our minds, change the way we do things so we no longer live for our belly, we no longer live for our ambition, we become vessels in his hand, he will fill us with his glory, with his presence, with his power, and his glory will go with us anywhere. Just like the book of Pastor Grace, his glory goes with us. And brother, sister, I want to say this to you. Please, death of self is the beginning of life with Elohim. It only matter what you're doing. You are not dead to self. Fast, pray, do anything. If you are not dead to self, you truly cannot be used by him. And listen, brothers and sisters, Without any shadow of doubt, I have seen, as the Lord showed me, how the church in the Western world will go into walking deception at the end of the age. How the great falling away. You've seen a little bit of it, but you never know how deep this thing is. Why? Because the church in the West, from the 4th century, created another Jesus that has been exported. Is not the all-powerful manifestation of Elohim on earth. No. Is it a, a Jesus you can use to create and sell Christian religion, which is about what you do inside buildings at certain holy days on certain holy times. The Yeshua Hamashiach that the Lord brought forth into the earth realm 2,000 years ago. If we truly understand him and embrace him wholly, we're going to know that we, certain things can grieve him Certain things can pain him. And in order to avoid grieving and paining him, we can say, Lord, just take out my old man. That ambitious fellow, that lying fellow, that person that can lie in wait for years, not manifested, doesn't even know himself. Lord, root it out of me. Purge me. Cleanse me and purify me that I may serve you. The assignments today before we pray. Please cite three scriptures which reveal the reality that Elohim manifests the presence of his soul realm. We're using that word, you know, with a lot of carefulness. We're talking about the realm of feelings, emotions, and thoughts, imaginations, and memory. That's simply what it is. Two, please explain why incarnation. So, sorry, two, please cite at least three theophanies which is bodily manifestation of Elohim in the earth realm before Yeshua came. Cite at least three. Three. Number three. Please explain why the incarnation of Yeshua as a human was the greatest expression of the love of Elohim for us and was a real theophany manifestation of Elohim in the earth realm. Therefore, what new things did you learn from this chapter? I want to pray for you. I want you to Tell the Lord, I don't want to keep struggling with you. I've struggled for a long time. But I don't want to, after making decisions, be scared when your word comes. I find myself defeated a few days later. Lord, I don't want you, your Christianity. Father, I want the death of the old man. So that Yeshua will be all in all inside of my being. And my being will be cleansed and purged and purified by the blood. It will be pure and holy that I may relate with you. Pray that prayer from your own heart before I pray for you. Father, behold your children. The word has gone forth. We cannot talk about these things smoothly with mere lips of clay. But within the ambit of what you have released today, I pray that there will be a walk of your spirit and of the sword of the spirit between the word and of the blood inside the heart, mind, and will and emotion of everyone who had. And you bring your people to the place of death of self and of willful giving up of themselves and embracing the fullness of Yeshua to live and reign in their heart a sovereign ruler. Lord, do it for your name's sake and let this lesson not depart from your people even as we go down the wire this week to finish up this course. We pray you will do it to the uttermost. 
that everything your people ought to understand, they will understand, and they will be able to teach this truth, and they will be able to live it out. And your name is honored and glorified. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayer. To you be all honor and glory. Blessed be your name forever. My Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. This weekend, Saturday, the Global Prayer and Spiritual Cabinet for the month of January, 4 p.m. London time, which is 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern, 5, 5 p.m. Uh, West Africa, 6 p.m. South African time, 7 p.m. East African time, and 8 p.m. Dubai, and then India, I think it's uh, about uh, 10 o'clock or so, or 9 o'clock. So please, Saturday, let's get together and pray. That's what the Lord showed. We're going to start with praise and worship. Praise and worship groups will from different parts of the world will praise and worship, and then we're going to prayer. We're going to pray for some of the critical things of this generation that are unfolding as the Lord called us strategic intercessors. Everything we're going to do in International Ministers Fellowship, it says, go by the word praise and prayer, and use it to clear the way. Brothers, we don't want to joke with that, and please, if you are not able to come, that's fine, but we're going to do this every last Saturday, just Obey the Lord and everything we are doing worldwide, he himself will open the doors to make them happen. And by the grace of the Lord, come along with us. The Lord will do you good. And if you don't have time, you can watch the recording later. Thank you so much, Elect, for being with us. Bye-bye.